Hello and welcome. Pretty bad night, so thank you for coming out. Um, I've just got a few words to say. Um, two excellent speakers here tonight. Um, but before I introduce them, I just want to say a few things. The camera, you probably notice there's got a camera, but it's only focused on the stage, so I don't think you're going to be recorded in the audience. That's fine. Um, after our speakers have finished, there will be a question and answer session and the mic will come round um, the floor. So if you want to speak, put your hand up. If you don't want to speak on mic, there's paper so you can put your questions on a bit of paper and somebody in the audience will collect them from you. Um, and after we're done, there's tea and coffee, there'll be more tea and coffee and we've got a wee bit of wine since there's only a few of us. If you want a glass of wine, stay. Um, and now, to our speakers. We have Eva Comrie, who's a child and family law specialist. <laughs> She's also bionic and immortal, Eva. Um, first of all, we'll hear from Shireen, Dr. Shireen Benjamin, who's a senior lecturer at, in primary education at Edinburgh, Edinburgh University. Thanks, and thank you very much for inviting me. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Um, lovely to be here on this rainy evening. So I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call gender identity ideology. And I noticed you've got a leaflet on the chairs. So some of you will know a lot of this um, really well already. But I'm actually going to explain it from the beginning because people use the language differently. So I'm going to explain how I use it. Um, and then I'll talk about how schools and teachers are being encouraged to teach it in the classroom. And I'll end with some information about how schools and teachers are being encouraged to respond to the growing numbers of children and adolescents who believe themselves to be of the opposite sex or of no sex at all. So first of all, what's gender identity ideology? And language in this area is contested. You'll hear different terms. That's the term I prefer to use. Um, at the core of gender identity ideology is a belief that all individuals have an inner sense of maleness or femaleness, or both or neither. And this inner sense is called gender identity. Gender identity ideology is the system of related beliefs stemming from this core belief. Um, that, and the person in gender identity ideology, a person's gender identity is the only thing that determines whether that person is a man or a woman or something else. So in this reading, biological sex is largely irrelevant. Um, individuals can come, become, become aware of their gender identity in very early childhood or in later adulthood or any time in between. And according to the ideology, it's possible for there to be a mismatch between biological sex and gender identity. And where that happens, according to this ideology, the person's gender identity is their real, authentic self, and only they can know it. So that means if a child with a male body, who we generally think of as a boy, if he's actually a girl if he says so, if he says he has an inner sense of femaleness. There's no scientific basis for these claims. They're what we call unfalsifiable, which is to say we can't conclusively disprove them any more than we can disprove any other subjective belief. But what we do know is that gender identity ideology contradicts many long-established and proven scientific realities to do with biological facts. And another thing that it contradicts with regard to children and adolescents is findings from the past 70 years um, about what's known as childhood gender dysphoria, which is um, explained a bit in the leaf that you've got. So gender dysphoria is a diagnosis given to children who are profoundly distressed by aspects of their sex bodies and who are insistent, persistent, and consistent that they are or should be of the opposite sex. So until recently, it was a comparatively rare condition, and it affected mostly boys. Usually starts in early childhood, persists until adolescence, at which point, for most children, it resolves naturally. And the figures vary a bit because of different diagnostic protocols in um, different countries and different areas, but until recently, about 80 to 85% of children were found to grow out of their gender dysphoria, with significant proportions coming out as lesbian or gay. And I'll be coming back to this. So until recently, the, you know, the core thing to get hold of is for most children, ge childhood gender dysphoria has resolved during adolescence. So the other thing just before I move on 
is that gender identity ideology also contradicts most feminist theorizing. So feminists have understood sex, biological sex, to be fixed and gender to be external and coercive. What I mean by that is a set of cultural expectations, roles and norms that children learn, stereotypes if you like. So feminists have consistently argued against gender. For feminists, your body makes you a woman or a man and that has consequences when the feminist project is to make it possible for women and men and girls and boys to have as far as possible the same opportunities, um, the same, not to be expected to behave in gender stereotypical ways or dress in certain ways or have certain jobs. Um, so to go back to gender identity ideology and the school curriculum, let's have a story because who doesn't love a story? I'm going to read a bit, you're not going to be able to see it very well from where you are. I'm going to read a bit from a picture book recommended in the Scottish Government document called Supporting Transgender Pupils in Schools. I'll come back to that document later. Um, so this is I Am Jazz. It's based on the life of a young person who's um, really alive in North America today. You can see it's got pictures, so it's aimed at young children, it's aimed at the under age group. I won't show you the pictures because he's too far away, sorry if that's really disappointing. You can look at it later. So the narr it's narrated in the first person by Jazz, and it goes, I am Jazz. For as long as I can remember, my favourite colour has been pink, my second favourite colour is silver, and my third favourite colour is green. And there's a picture of Jazz dressed as a princess. Here are some of my other favourite things. Dancing, singing, backflips, drawing, soccer, swimming, makeup, and pretending I'm a pop star. Most of all, I love mermaids. Sometimes I even wear a mermaid tail in the pool. My best friends are Samantha and Casey. We always have fun together. We like high heels and princess gowns, or cartwheels and trampolines. And there's lots of pictures of little girls having fun, and wearing dresses with ponytails. But I'm not exactly like Samantha and Casey. I have a girl brain but a boy body. This is called transgender. I was born this way. And we see a picture of um, a little girl colouring things in. When I was very little, and my mum would say, you're such a good boy, I would say, no mama, good girl. Picture of a toddler. At first my family was confused. They'd always thought of me as a boy. As I got older, I hardly ever played with trucks or tools or superheroes, only princesses and mermaid costumes. My brothers told me this was girl stuff. I kept right on playing. My sister says I was always talking to her about my girl thoughts and my girl dreams and how one day I would be a beautiful lady. She would giggle and say, you're a funny kid. There's a picture of an older girl and a little one wearing pink. Then one amazing day, everything changed. Mum and Dad took me to meet a new doctor who asked me lots and lots of questions. Afterwards, the doctor spoke to my parents and I heard the word transgender for the first time. That night, at bedtime, my parents hugged me and said, we understand now, be who you are. We love you no matter what. Mum said that jazz would, being jazz would make me different from the other kids at school, but that being different is okay. What's important, she said, is that I'm happy with who I am. So then we fast forward a few years, and Jazz tells us, even today there are kids who tease me, or call me by a boy name, or ignore me altogether. This makes me feel crummy. Then I remember that the kids who get to know me usually want to be my friend. They say I'm one of the nicest girls at school. And there's a picture of a girl with other girls being friendly. So. That's how the Scottish Government is advising teachers to present gender identity to very young children. The toddler boy, Jazz, in the book apparently knew his gender identity at an age when children actually don't understand the permanent nature of sex and at an age when the lines between fantasy and reality are very blurry. Those of you who have children will know or work with children know that the line between fantasy and reality for children of this age group is quite hard to define. So the narrator, Jazz, tells small children that it's possible to have a girl brain and a boy body when there's no scientific evidence that such a thing is possible. And the clear message to children at the end of the book is that it's mean or nasty to disbelieve or questions any, question anyone's stated identity, gender identity. They have to be believed 
because, of course, they're speaking an authentic truth. The book doesn't explain how a child's supposed to know what their gender identity is, except by, reference to, except by referencing to stereotypes about what girls and boys are supposed to like. If you're a boy who likes pink and princesses, you must be a girl, is the message. I'll read you a little bit from another book called Who Are You? It's called The Kid's Guide to Gender Identity. And it says, this is a story about you. The important thing to remember is you are the one who knows you best. When babies are born, people ask, is it a boy or a girl? Babies can't talk, so grown-ups make a guess by looking at their bodies. This is the sex assigned to you at birth, male or female. Sometimes people get this confused with gender, but gender is much more than the body you were born with. As babies grow into kids, they start to know what they like and don't like. This is your personal expression, what you like and how you dress and act. And then there's lots of pages of toys and games and clothes that children can um, look at and choose from. And it says, kids know a lot about themselves. They know who they are by how they feel inside. This is your identity, who you feel like inside, who you know yourself to be. This can change as you grow up or change from day to day. It's what makes you you. Some people say there are only two genders, but really there are many genders. You are who you say you are because you know best. For some people, the grown-ups guess right about their body and their gender. This is called cisgender, when someone's identity matches their sex assigned at birth. And for some people, there are more than just two choices. These are just a few words people use. Trans, genderqueer, non-binary, gender fluid, transgender, gender neutral, agender, neutra, bigender, third gender, two spirit. So this is a picture book intended for children under eight. And it introduces children to more of the language that's associated with gender identity ideology, that sex is irrelevant, assigned at birth as a kind of guess by a medical professional, and again, it doesn't tell us how a child's supposed to know their gender identity, just that it's personal to them and is the truth. And I think this is a really confusing message to give to young children. I do want to emphasize here, we don't know how widespread these recommended resources are or how many primary schools are teaching children about gender identity in these terms. The point is, schools and teachers are increasingly encouraged to do so because it's supposedly inclusive and progressive. And that is a real problem because you've got an unscientific and unproven belief system which is being taught as though it's a universally accepted truth. And you, know, you can see where that might go. So a bit earlier, I said that for about 80% of children diagnosed with gender dysphoria, their unhappiness with their sex bodies resolves during puberty. And until recently, the recommended approach for these children was called watchful waiting which meant supporting the child, affirming that their feelings are real and painful, um, but reassur and reassuring them they're very likely to grow out of them. But in recent years, I mean the past 10 years or so, speeding up dramatically in the last five years, there have been two very significant changes. So the first of these changes is that as gender identity ideology has become more and more popular, the number of children who believe themselves to be of the opposite sex, or both sexes or no sex at all, has massively increased. Uh, it's over 5,000% increase. That's true of the younger age group, pre-puberty, but it's most evident in adolescents, especially adolescent girls. So until the last 10 years, gender dysphoria among adolescent girls was almost unknown. Whereas now it's hard to find a secondary school without at least one or two girls um, asserting a transgender or a non-binary identity. Non-binary, I should say, is where somebody believes that they're of both sexes or no sex at all, um, or some other combination. And some schools have significant numbers of such girls. And in 2018, an American social psychologist called Lisa Lippmann coined a term called rapid onset gender dysphoria, and you'll sometimes see that referred to as ROGD, which describes the social phenomenon of teenagers especially girls identifying as trans. Now, this isn't a new diagnosis. It's a description of a social phenomenon, and it refers to gender dysphoria that presents quickly and intensely, as opposed to the childhood version that comes on gradually and persists. This version um, presents quickly, very intensely, usually after an extended period of time spent engaged online. 
It's especially prevalent among girls who are experiencing other forms of distress, um, including those experiencing social emotional difficulties, and especially among autistic girls. And a psychotherapist called Stella O'Malley has described the ROG population as overwhelmingly nerdy girls. You can imagine what she means by that. Having difficulties fitting in socially. And you can imagine that for girls who are finding it difficult to fit in, the idea that all their problems are because they've been born in the wrong body and they can be a new person by claiming a trans identity, that's desperately attractive. And I'm not saying that these girls' feelings aren't real. I think they are. But we do need to question how they've arrived at what rapidly become very strong and very fixed beliefs. So with growing numbers of children and young people experiencing gender dysphoria, schools and teachers need advice on how to respond. And last August, the Scottish Government issued some guidance. This 2021 guidance turned out, it was long awaited, turned out to be a slightly amended version of guidance written by the lobby group LGBT Youth Scotland, which was withdrawn in July 2019 after it was found to be unlawful in places. Now, the first thing you'll notice if you pick up a hard copy of the guidance is its title, Supporting Transgender Pupils in Schools. I've been very careful this evening, as indeed I always am, to refer to children and adolescents with gender dysphoria or children and adolescents who believe themselves to be of the opposite sex. And there's a good reason for that. When it comes to younger children, we don't know and we can't know which of the children experiencing gender dysphoria will find it resolves during puberty, which is most of them, and which will be in the minority for whom it doesn't resolve. And when it comes to adolescents, there's loads we don't know in relation to this sudden, very significant increase in numbers. But we have to at least be open-minded to there being a variety of psychosocial factors including social media activity, peer pressure, and what's known as social contagion. ROGD is a very new phenomenon. We can't possibly know yet which of the girls affected will find that their gender dysphoria persists into adulthood, probably very few. But just the title of the Scottish Government guidance tells us, by referring to transgender pupils, the idea that a child or an adolescent claiming a transgender identity is transgender, using that title, shows us that the guidance is underpinned by and informed by gender identity ideology. Because in gender identity ideology, the only explanation for a child or an adolescent asserting a gender identity that doesn't match their biological sex is that they are a transgender pupil. So that's how we get a clue from its title where the Scottish Government's guidance is coming from. So what does it advise teachers to do? I think it's actually got some good advice in it. I wouldn't junk the whole lot. It's got some good advice. Here's how it starts off. If a young person in the school says they now want to live as a boy, although their sex assigned at birth was female, or they now want to live as a girl, although their sex assigned at birth was male, it's important to provide support and listen to what they are saying. Now, aside from that phrase, sex assigned at birth, which I don't believe to be accurate and is scientifically unproven, if we bracket that out, I agree provide support and listen. I think that's what we do need to do with young people who are distressed. They go on, if a young person would like changes to be made in order that they're supported to learn, then consider what is in the best interest of the young person. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. You know, do think about what's in the, interest of this best, best, the best interests of this child. But how are teachers to know these best interests? Have they been told in the Scottish Government guidance that most primary school aged children with gender dysphoria, even those that are most insistent, grow out of it during puberty? No, they're not told that. The guidance doesn't refer to it. Are they told that ROGD is a complex um, social phenomenon, poorly understood at the moment, affecting the most vulnerable teenage girls? No, they're not told any of that. So teachers are asked to make decisions about what's in a child's best interest without knowing that really important information. Here's where it then goes. If a young person comes out to you, and by comes out, they're um, meaning they tell you their gender identity, it's important not to deny their identity or to overly question their understanding of their gender identity. So in other words, teachers are being told not to encourage children or young people to reflect on how they've come to their beliefs which is what you would absolutely do in any other context. The guidance goes on. Ask what name and pronoun you should use to address them. 
using the correct pronouns, by which it means the pronouns the pupils requested, is the right and respectful approach to including transgender young people. Staff and young people should avoid misgendering a transgender young person. And so it goes on. So what it's telling teachers is you do need to take that child's uh, asserted transgender identity as a manifestation of their true authentic self. Now the practice of changing a child's name to one associated with the opposite sex and using pronouns of the opposite sex or of no sex at all is known as social transition. And it may sound simple, it, you know, it may sound as if it's no big deal, but in reality it's a major psychosocial intervention. Because if you treat a child as if they're of the opposite sex or no sex at all, in a context in which you're teaching gender identity ideology as a truth that can't be questioned, then social transition means you're confirming a child's fantasy that they are and they can be of the opposite sex. And again, because this is also new, we can't know the long-term effects of socially transitioning children, but there is already some evidence from North America, which is a few years ahead of us, that socially transitioning young children makes it much less likely that their gender dysphoria will resolve during puberty. In other words, it seems likely that if you confirm a child's fantasy belief that they're really of the opposite sex, you make it harder for their distress about their sex body to resolve as they mature. Does this matter? Well, yes, it does, for all sorts of reasons, but not least because it puts children on a trajectory towards major physical medical interventions in their late teens, such as double mastectomies of healthy breasts for girls, very significant hormone treatment. So by socially transitioning children in school, we're quite possibly putting them on a path towards becoming lifelong medical patients, when left to the, watchful, the previous watchful waiting approach, most of would have grown into adults who could live comfortably in their sexed bodies. And yet, in the absence of any good evidence to support the efficacy of social transition, and in the absence of medical and psychological training for teachers, the Scottish Government and the lobby groups who may also be advising schools are telling teachers that social, social transition is the only progressive, inclusive way to respond to pupils who assert a transgender identity. Now, as I said before, we don't know the extent of the reach of, trans of gender identity ideology in schools. If you're a concerned parent or grandparent or member of a community and you want to know more, I would suggest you approach the head teacher with some specific questions. You can ask whether they use the Scottish Government guidance. It's not statutory, they don't have to use it, but as far as I can tell, large numbers of head teachers do use it because this is such a contest contested area and they don't want to get things wrong. They're scared of making mistakes. You can ask whether the school has had training on gender identity, and by that I mean workshops for staff, might be workshops for pupils, from any of the lobby groups that are active in this area. If they have, you can ask to see the materials that are being used. You can ask to see the resources that are used to support teaching about gender identity in the curriculum, such as the books that I've been referring to. And if this is all a bit new and confusing, you're not sure that you've got the confidence to discuss it with a head teacher, which is fair enough, a really good place to look is the website at the websites of two organisations, Transgender Trend and Safe Schools Alliance. Transgender Trend has its own guidance for schools, which is excellent, which can be shared um, with the school that you're part of. Um, so there's, there's plenty there to help you get up to speed. I've just done a very brief and superficial introduction to some of the issues. I hope it's made some kind of sense, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Before I hand off over to Eva, these documents are on the table at the back. We've got copies of them here for you if you want to have a look. Eva. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, these are very difficult and weird days that we're living through, and the fact that this meeting's happening tonight is probably very opposite, given that we know that tomorrow will be the publication of the Scottish Government's Gender Reform Bill. So, set against that background, I thought you'd like to know what the current legislation in relation to gender recognition actually says. It's an Act of Parliament that was passed in 2004, and the reason for it was that there were a couple of decisions in the European courts which indicated that the UK government's views 
in relation to gender or transgendered people were outdated. So the law was changed to introduce the ability to change your sex marker on your birth certificate. But at the time that that act passed through the Westminster Parliament, it was deemed to be too controversial to tell the public that it was an attempt to introduce a law to change sex, primarily because 20 odd years ago, the general public didn't believe that it was possible that you could change your sex. Apparently, that's no longer the case, and some folk think you can. You know, I'm not one of them. So, the gender um, recognition legislation um, has a preface, an introduction that all Acts of Parliament have to have. And it's a sneaky one, because although the title of the Act is the Gender Recognition Act 2004, the introduction says, this is an Act of Parliament to make provision for and in connection with change of gender. So, the original issue was that pensions legislation was deemed to be unfair as between men and women because there were different pensions ages. And it was also deemed to be unfair that somebody who was transgender couldn't marry somebody of the same sex. But that was because we didn't have same-sex marriage then, which obviously we've got now. So the start of the proposal was, we'll allow folk to change their gender. When you go through the legislation, what it says is, if you have a medical diagnosis which is certificated by your medical practitioners and is confirmed to be gender dysphoria, and if you live in the opposite gender, i.e. opposite sex, from that you were born in, if you do that for two years, you can then apply for and usually get a gender recognition certificate. When you've got that, which says you now have a new gender, the legal jump that is made is that you can use that certificate to change the sex box on your birth certificate. So you've got a process that started off as supposedly changing your gender, which nobody can properly um, define, but the legal process actually allows you to change your legal sex. But bear in mind that when that legislation went through Westminster, it was accepted that it was really just a kind of legal fiction, a legal kindness to help a very small percentage of the population who suffered from a particular recognised medical condition. So that in those days, 20 years ago or so, if you were transgender, it was because you were described as having a diagnosis of dysphoria. So if you kind of put that to one side and look at where we are now, where we've got to is it's widely anticipated that tomorrow's bill will be very similar to the, the, the draft that was seen a while ago that was the subject of a few botched consultations. It's expected that the bill will authorise um, or, or approve or suggest or recommend that you can change your gender legally, i.e. change your sex, without having a medical definition, and then the two years of living in the new gender will be reduced to either three months or six months, depending on which paper you've been reading. Now, what you'll find is the Scottish Government in the main and at the moment, unfortunately, a majority of Scottish politicians think that they can tell folk like us that this is an administrative matter which will affect a very small minority of the population and all it's doing is tidying up what has been a quite difficult and painful exercise for people who are, in fact, transgender. But you can see there's a massive difference because, in effect, if the medical diagnosis goes and the certification by, a, by medics is no longer required, then anybody who wants to change their gender is going to be able to do that and get a gender recognition certificate by claiming, A, I've changed my gender, I've been living this new life for three months, six months, whatever it is, and the only proof that they have to have of that looks like it's going to have to be something like a utility bill where the name is not the name you were given at birth, but is the name of the opposite sex from what your body is. So the reality there is it's going to be very easy for that whole process to be manipulated and abused by people who are not acting in good faith. 
So, in, in, re in fact, the definition of transgender has, if this act were, if this bill were to be passed, has become much wider. And instead of dealing only with a very small percentage of the population, I think something like 0.018, is that not the figure that's quoted usually? Um, that, that was supposedly the figure of people that would have gender dysphoria. You can see that the, the number of people that will be able to apply under the new regime is actually absolutely limitless. Anybody that wants to say they are changing their gender will be able to do so. So where that becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to manage is that the Equality Act, which refers to protected characteristics such as not being able to be discriminated against on the basis of your sex or your race, doesn't say you've not to be discriminated against on the basis of gender identity. It refers to gender reassignment. So there is an argument, again one that I don't agree with, which is put forward particularly by Stonewall to the effect that if you've decided that you're in a process of changing your gender, you're entitled to be treated as your new gender. And that's where issues arise in relation to the need or the um, validity of retaining single sex spaces. And that particularly comes into close consideration for women and girls. So if the gender recognition or gender reform process is allowed to proceed the way that we think the Scottish Government wants, and obviously the SNP have the support of the Greens, if this bill passes into law, what you will find is that you're risking very much that a number of people who don't have gender dysphoria, but have just made a lifestyle choice, they claim, can end up with a GRC and then try and argue their way into single sex spaces which were designed for the opposite sex from the one in which they were born. And obviously all the statistics suggest that it's males who are likely to do that acting in bad faith. Um, and that, that's not a, an indicator that I have any malice against trans people. I'm pointing out that loopholes like this are very able to be um, manipulated and abused and taken advantage of by people acting in bad faith. Now, the principal position where that's clear is in relation to prisons. Now, um, I think that most folk here will know that at the moment it's accepted by the Scottish Government that there are at least 12 people who were born male presently serving sentences in female prisons. It's understood, I think, that at least 11 of those have not had any surgery. So that's 11 men with male bodies locked up with women. That's not acceptable from my perspective, and I don't care whether they've got a GRC or not. I believe that most of them don't. Um, but I do understand that it's very clear um, from records kept by various organisations that the view in the Scottish Government and in their advisory bodies was that it was, um, it was opposite to use female prisons as, in effect, the experimental ground because, and I'm, I'm going to quote you this because I don't think you'd believe me if I didn't, um, a chap who works for a government-funded charity, here we go, Mr James Morton, you should keep a note of that name because you'll be hearing that a lot in the future, in 2018, he wrote, and this is a guidance for the Scottish Prison Service, we strategised that by working intensively with the Scottish Prison Service to support them to include trans women as women on a self-declaration basis within very challenging circumstances, we would be able to ensure that all other public services should be able to do likewise. So, in effect, several years ago, before we've talked about any need to reform the original process whereby you need a medical certificate and two years living in your new um, gender before you can get your GRC, this chap's recommending to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Prison Service, that they should start allowing men to be housed in women's prisons. And that's exactly what happened. 
So not only did that happen there, there was also substantial guidance written for several, if not all, um, NHS hospital trusts in Scotland, whereby males were also allowed to self-identify into female spaces. Um, the, those that I've read, but I think have probably disappeared temporarily from the internet, were Greater Glasgow and Fourth Valley Health Boards, and their guidance um, made it very plain that if a self-identified trans person asked to be um, housed or treated in the ward of the gender into which they had chosen to identify, then that's exactly where they were to be treated. The guidance in both um, cases, though, went on to say, and most starkly in the Glasgow one, that if there was a patient, say, say your, your um, patient was a, a male, a trans-identifying male who considered himself female, and you put him in a female ward, the guidance said in terms and nobody will accuse me of telling lies about this. It was there in black and white. It might still be there. The guidance says in terms that if a trans-identifying male, that's a man who says he's a woman, is in a woman's ward, and if a woman, born female and continuing to live a female life, is in that ward because she wants to be in a female ward, and she points out that she's a bit upset and a bit concerned because there's a male-bodied patient in the ward, then the advice to the nurse, and again, I'm, I'm quoting, says that the nurse must speak to the patient and explain, this is a female ward, only female patients are in this ward. And I'm not kidding, I'm not lying, that is the guidance, and I'll challenge anybody to say otherwise. So if the female patient says, I object to this because that's a man and I don't want a man in my ward, this is a female ward, then the nurse has to warn the female patient that her conduct may constitute, in effect, hate for which she might be reported. And the ultimate sanction would be that the female patient would jeopardise her own treatment because the feelings of the trans-identifying male are considered to be superior to the sex-based rights of the female. That's the law. But that's, that, that's entirely and completely wrong. The sex-based rights of the female take priority over the feelings of the male is the law, but not as the Scottish Government see it or want us to see it. But that position applies in more than just hospital wards. Um, I, you probably all know um, that there are various um, high street retailers that think that men can use women's changing rooms. I shudder to think what will go on in places like that if this is permitted to continue. Um, we also know, um, and I know that, that locally it's, it's controversial and very painful for some people, that there are circumstances where there have been trans-identifying males prosecuted and convicted of um, serious misconduct by being able to access women's spaces or girls' spaces. Um, there are ongoing difficulties, obviously, in prisons um, to the extent where, I think it was yesterday I saw on Twitter, an advert from the Scottish Prison Service explaining that they're going to be looking at rewriting their transgender guidance and they would like people that know about it to contribute to the process. Like, I don't believe this. They have had guidance in place for five or six years. They consulted, in inverted commas, widely, but they did not consult with female groups and they didn't consult with female prisoners. And the result of that has been a number of very upsetting incidents that you've probably heard Rona Hotchkiss and others talking about, whereby female prisoners were assaulted. Unfortunately, that particular matter was debated in the House of Lords a few weeks ago and uh, my partner Matt sitting there was going off like a rocket at me when I was shouting and screaming at the telly because the debate went on for several hours. Some of you maybe watched it. And some of the members of the House of Lords were very passionate about the need to protect women and particularly the need to protect female prisoners from male predators. Um, there were statistics, which I agree with, um, quoted in relation to many male prisoners who had lived an entirely male life 
some were rapists, some were serial sexual offenders, some of them were amongst the worst offenders that we've probably ever seen in the UK. But the minute that they were being sentenced, they were identifying as female and getting shunted into female prisons. Several members of the House of Lords refused to accept that that happens. Now, I've worked for 40 years uh, looking after various people who have been victims and have represented perpetrators. And yes, of course, these things do go on because there are some folk on this planet that will take advantage of every single opportunity that they can get. And that is not me expressing hate crime against trans people. That's me pointing out a simple fact that every police officer, every lawyer, every sheriff, every judge and every prison officer will tell you there are some nutters that will do anything to get to their prey. And that's the hard fact of life. And it's something that, talking about um, recognising a, a, a male prisoner who says he's female and putting him into a female prison ought to be an absolute non-starter. However, several of the members of the House of Lords um, who disagree with that view, um, and I would have my suspicions about them, they were able to outvote those who had what you would call the common sense um, view. So those matters will all be reviewed by the, the House of Lords. Whatever they decide will make no odds to what happens in Scotland, because obviously this bill is going to proceed as from tomorrow. Um, but where there are other gender-related problems um, in Scotland, extend, obviously, as Shireen has said, into the transgender guidance for schools. And what I would invite you to consider there is, tomorrow what's presented in the Scottish Parliament will be a bill that if it passes, it will pass because MSPs in a majority have voted it into law. So it becomes the law of the land, whether we like it or not. But transgender guidance is guidance. And you would want to ask yourself, why is it guidance? Why is it not law? And I'll give you the answer. It's guidance because if you as a parent find that your school is implementing this guidance in a fashion that you don't agree with, then you have to complain about the school and you have to sue your local authority. The Scottish Government will be able to say, it wasn't us. We just gave the school some guidance. They were not legally obliged to follow it. So your beef is with them, it's no way us. Now, that's the kind of sneaky, two-faced, underhanded approach that you get for the, the Scottish Government these days. So tomorrow, when you watch the telly and you hear the big um, routine about here's the gender reform bill and here's Patrick Harvey and my good pal, uh, what's her name, Lorna Slater, uh, she blocked me on Twitter because I asked her to tell me the definition of women. So <laughs> you can imagine. Um, you'll hear them tell you how transgender people are amongst the most, most vilified in the country and how hate crime against LGBT has rocketed. If you actually look at the statistics, hate crime against trans people um, has increased, but nowhere near the extent that it's been, it's been suggested. But there have been concerted attempts by some of the charities that, again, are, are funded by the Scottish Government to encourage people to report events which we know are not, in fact, hate crime. I refer particularly to offensive stickering um, in ribbons. So yes, statistics will have increased, but they're not crime statistics. They're people who claim that their feelings have been hurt. And I don't think that legislation is there to deal only with feelings when you're talking in terms of a couple of innocent ribbons or a sticker. Um, beyond that, I don't know if you want me to speak a little bit more about parental rights, parental responsibilities. Um, just shout if I'm boring you. Um, in relation to the schools, bear in mind that as a parent, you've got a legal responsibility to guide your child and you've got a legal duty to be involved in your child's education. Um, if you have information about your child's education or your child's health that you think the teachers or medics that deal with your child should know about, you've got a legal obligation to pass that information on you've got a legal duty to obtain information from teachers and medics and use that information to promote and 
um, encourage and secure your child's well-being, your child's welfare, and look after and prioritise your child's best interest. What you don't have is a right to keep secrets that are opposite to how you rear your child from any professional person with the right to ask for that information, nor do you have the right to keep secrets from the child's other parent. However, the transgender guidance authorises the school to keep secrets from you, the parent. It's meant to be a two-way street. If you are allowed information from them, I don't see how they're allowed to withhold information from you. But if they are, think on this. The Scottish law um, can be divided into two, two types, if you like. Private law and public law as it relates to children. Private law is about disputes between parents and carers. Public law is when the social work department become involved and the children's panel might be involved. The overarching principles of all of the legislation in relation to those two different forums is to do with what is conducive to the child's welfare and what's your responsibility as a parent. We don't own our children anymore. We used to talk about custody and access. Now we talk about parental rights and responsibilities because we have duties as parents to, and those duties have to be fulfilled and we've got rights to ensure that we fulfil the duties. And what that really means in very simple terms is that children look to adults to make the decisions about them in relation to the matters that are far-reaching in their lives. You know, if you were applying to adopt a child, what you have to swear to a sheriff is that it's your intention to give that child roots and wings to fly. And it's about giving them a grounding and it's about giving them the encouragement to go out into the world. And there's a phrase in the midst of the adoption legislation that I like and it's to do with giving that child who came into your family the ability and the, the, the faith and the pride to have a lifelong and very positive attitude in relation to development of everything, every aspect of the personality. So that as a parent, what you're not supposed to do is to restrict your conduct to daft wee daily issues that then suddenly have a kind of end point. What you're meant to do is to give your children a grounding that will last them throughout their childhood and into adulthood. And I'm not making the point very well, but what I'm really meaning to say is if a child is going to make a far-reaching decision, that decision should be made in conjunction with the views of the people who know them best and who love them best. And it's usually, it's not always, but it's usually their parents. So for me as a lawyer, looking at transgender guidance and knowing that children are allowed to keep secrets from their parents and knowing that teachers are actively encouraged in a way to enable them to keep those secrets and that children will be able to change their gender at school and have their new gender affirmed at school without their parents knowing, then I worry about where that takes these children, especially when you see, and, and again, Shreen touched on this a bit, what happens further down the line. They get referred on elsewhere, they've already affirmed a new identity, how do they backtrack from that if they tell their parents and it was against the parents' wishes or the parents were upset that they didn't know about it? Does that make the child more or less likely to grow out of something that they might have grown out of anyway? Does it make them more determined to stay in a set of circumstances that's actually wrong for them but they just don't want to admit it? But get further down the line and they'll have, if, if they insist that they are transgender at a young age, there will be talk about things that no parent wants to contemplate, such as puberty blockers and surgery. Um, if you look at the, I think is it the GoFundMe website, you'll see um, a lot of crowdfunders for children, not just in the States or in Canada, but a lot, of them in, a lot of them are in Scotland. Children looking for money for what they call top surgery and bottom surgery. And... I was fully expecting to recognise some of the faces on that website. It's really concerning when you read it. Um, because what these children don't get is they don't get the truth, 
about what happens to you if you take puberty blockers at a young age. Horrible things happen to both girls and boys if they start these things too young and they end up medicated for the rest of their lives. I'm sure you've all seen, especially on Twitter, some of the videos and some of the pictures of young folk being... I don't know what the word is. I was going to say mutilated, but it's not a strong enough word. Butchered. I Butchered because adults have told them that they can have various operations and turn into the sex that they think that they want to be. It's obviously most prevalent in girls at, at the moment, as Shireen has also said, and there will be reasons for that, and we can work out what some of them are likely to be. Part of it is social contagion, um, but there are lots of other things there that are quite sinister and very difficult to have to consider. Um, the statistics, and um, Shireen will know this, the, the detail of this better than I do, but I know that in terms of girls who are claiming to be transgender, it's felt that about a quarter of them are probably on the autistic spectrum, and out of the remainder of them, there's probably another quarter that have suffered different sorts of trauma or separations or family breakdowns or just things that have been difficult sets of circumstances to deal with. And where, where that becomes an, an added concern is because the Scottish Government want to get away from having a medicalised definition of getting a GRC, there is a claim that being transgender is not a health issue. But if it's not a health issue, why do we have kids on puberty blockers and adolescents and folk in their 20s looking for top and bottom surgery? To me, that's a health issue. Why, why otherwise would you be taking medication? You're taking medication because you can't accept the body that you've got, you think. Um, so overall, I'm sorry to say it's dark days in Scotland and they're going to get a lot darker before they get any lighter. Um, what I would say... If you really want to, to educate yourself directly rather than listen to what other folk have to say, a good website, but it's quite heartbreaking as well, is LGBT Youth Scotland. I don't agree with a lot of what they say there. I do agree with some of what they say, but the particular bit I wanted to read to you was their definition from 2017. And this is a website for kids. Transgender. When, how you feel about your gender identity, like a woman or a man or neither or both, is different from what people expected from you when you were born. I don't know what that means, because when I was born, I don't know what my mum and dad expected for me. But if they thought it was going to be hearts and flowers and unicorns and glitter, they had another thing coming. Um, I was probably a boy, um, because I wore wellies and played football. Um, However, um, another thing that's, that's really worth a look at came out today um, is a massive report, which I think in the main will be really very good and very positive for Scotland's children. It's called The State of Children's Rights in Scotland, and it's by the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. It has, it's a couple hundred pages long. There's a lot of great stuff in it um, about all different aspects of children's lives, their needs and their rights. But there's a disappointing bit in it, um, which refers to children who are LGBTQA+, and how they often face homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. It's worth a look, because unfortunately, that part of what is otherwise a fantastic report refers back to the transgender definitions and transgender um, analysis done by LGBT who in turn have an involvement with some of the people currently involved in promoting the new gender reform and previously involved with the issues surrounding um, allowing trans identifying men into women's prisons. So, on that, thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? Hi. Um, what advice do you have, just on your subject of teachers, the teachers have been given a very strict response which they are allowed to give and ways to deal with any issues at school which arise. 
they would love, or speaking uh, on behalf of a couple of teachers, they would love to have the opportunity to more explore with the kid what's going wrong, why they hate their body, why they hate going through puberty, why they, what it is that's up with them. Instead, they have to go down the official route that you've sort of already been describing. One teacher in particular would love to challenge that, but is unable within the school structure. Any suggestions? Thank you. That is a really, really good question. And I know it's exercising a lot of teachers. I go into school, quite a lot of schools, um, so I hear from teachers of all views. I mean, I don't know, obviously, um, the nature of the school. What I would say and do say to teachers is to find like-minded teachers, if they possibly can, so that if there's a group of you, um, it's much easier to start asking some hard questions. What I would then do is um, advise them to become well informed. So, you know, a lot of teachers have hunches. This, this doesn't feel right. You know, this is what teachers say to me. You know, it doesn't feel right. I'm a science teacher. You know, on one, the one hand, I teach children about biological sex. And then on the other hand, if a child expresses a transgender identity, this is the response I have to give. It doesn't sit right. But that's quite often at the level of hunch. Um, so I think you, know, you find your other like-minded teachers, you work out what it is that you have the difficulty with. And then I would ask questions. So you know, go to a head teacher and say, well, are you aware that most children in the past have grown out of gender dysphoria? And the research is telling us that if you give children a clear message that their feelings are real, their feelings matter, and we understand this is difficult for them, but you don't confirm that they really are of the opposite, but you um, don't confirm they're of the opposite sex. They're likely to find that their distress resolves, but the research tells us, dear head teacher, that if you do confirm they're of the opposite sex, it's much harder for that to resolve. Pose it as a question to the head teacher. What do you think? You know, do you think it's all right that um, we're potentially uh, setting children on a trajectory where they may be medicalized. So pose it as a question, because that way, you know, that, that's where you can find the contradictions. Um, look for other contradictions in the school's practice, so you know, between the science curriculum and the social studies curriculum is a place of contradiction. Um, if, you're, you, if your school is a primary school, you're using I Am Jazz or similar books, um, you're also likely to be addressing gender stereotyping with children in some lessons. You're likely to be saying to children, of course, boys can be gentle and studious and wear pink and play in the dressing up corner. And of course, girls can play football. You're likely to be giving that message until the point at which somebody, a child says, well, actually, I'm really a boy. And then the messaging changes. So point out that contradiction to a head teacher and ask how it needs to be addressed and resolved. Um, so for me, it's, you know, the, the two things are, the three things are, find your like-minded teachers if you possibly can. I know in a small school that's really difficult. Um, but if you can find like-minded teachers, do that, or other members of the community if you need to. Get as informed as you can. Transgender Trend is a, um, has lots and lots of resources on their website and a very good um, set of guidance for schools. So you know, you've got that that you can use. And then when you're approaching senior staff, look for the contradictions that you can ask questions about so that you can prize open any space. That the thing that we don't want is these certainties. You know, what LGBT Youth Scotland and Stonewall Scotland and other groups are going into schools is doing is talking in terms of certainties. This is the right thing to do. And that's desperately seductive when you're a busy teacher or a busy head teacher. You want to be told the right thing to do. Um, if you can disrupt those certainties, that's where you can open up a conversation, I think. But I do understand how difficult it is in current circumstances. I'm not diminishing that. Thanks. Where I find that really difficult is if you're, you're the teacher and you're struck with, for example, um, the boy who says he's a girl 
and the guidance says he should be allowed to use the facilities for the gender into which he, he would take himself. Quite honestly, that gives me the creeps for a number of different reasons. And I just can't believe that we're having to have that conversation. Um, I suspect um, that there will be very many more professionals, whether it's teachers, education psychologists, social workers, health visitors, who will be as uncomfortable about all of this. They probably are far more realistic in the main than some of our legislators and politicians are. Um, they've seen this, you know, from, from probably all different angles that politicians don't think of or don't want to consider. Um, I would particularly suggest that you compare this with the outcry that there was in England in relation to the Girl Guides organisation, because you'll have seen the the guide leader who got into bother because she objected to was it boys being able to be guides and go and camp and then recently we had the controversy about the male who said he was a female guide leader i was in the brownies i was in the guides my mum would never have sent me on a camp if she thought that one of the guides or brownie leaders was a man it just wouldn't have happened but of course the process now is that you're not allowed to know because it's private there's something very, very wrong at the heart of all of that. Um, so I kind of think that unions particularly are likely to do what has happened recently with the female um, union federation that's just been invented. I'm not sure the full name of it. Is it the Women's Trade Union Movement? They only um, appeared on the scene maybe about a fortnight ago. I would imagine that, that teaching unions and probably other organisations, whether it's social workers or whatever, will develop their own wing, which will be, in inverted commas, gender critical, for want of a better expression. Um, and, and I would hope that that happens sooner rather than later. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm kind of going to stick to the schools um, issue just now because I made an FY request, an FY request to my children's school just before Christmas to ask if they had had any of these external organisations into the school, um, either directly teaching children or training the teachers. And I also asked for copies of the materials that were used. And the reply I got was, yes, we do. We've had, I think it was LGBT youth and one other, don't quote me because I can't, I can't remember, but they refused to provide the materials using the commercially sensitive exemption in the FOI legislation. So my question is really, what can we do to, to force them to release this information? I can't really understand why they won't say what the materials are. Um, they will be the materials that are on the LGBT youth website. Um, and there's 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 lists of them there. Um, I think a way around that would be to speak to councillors, MSPs, MPs, and say to them, it's not good enough. Um, we need to know why can't we know? I'd probably be writing to the press about it as well, um, because the more um, it's the you know the usual sunlight's the best disinfectant. What are they hiding? Because uh, that's not commercially sensitive. That's something else. Something no very nice, or they would be happy to tell us. I'm, I'm wondering whether it was the Thai campaign, Time for Inclusive Education, because they have, I've, I've noticed on their website, they have kind of two steps to it. They have some materials that are universally accessible, anybody can go in and find them, and then they have some that aren't. Um, and the website says you, ha you, know, you have, your school has to join, has to be a member. So I can imagine they're using the commercially sensitive argument um, to say that you know, this is our intellectual property and we don't want it out there in the public domain. But that's not, you know, that, that doesn't meet the threshold for commercially sensitive under the FOI legislation. So I, I don't think they can get away with that one. But I'm certainly I'm aware of that organisation doing that. Thank you.
I'm just wondering how our two speakers still have jobs with your gender critical views. There's so many people lost their jobs or been. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm a senior member of a university. I have academic freedom. I am an established academic. I'm in my late 50s. All those things are important. What that means is I'm, dif I'm difficult to sack. People are trying. Um, people constantly try. I am difficult to sack um, because I'm not actually saying anything that's out with what is protected by academic freedom. Now, people who are more junior than me and people on precarious contracts, which a lot of ac ac junior academics are, cannot say the things that I say because if you're in a position where you need promotion, then you know, don't talk about anything to do with sex and gender identity at the moment unless you're going to toe the approved line, unless you're going to um, follow the queer theory line, which is popular in universities at the moment, which is a, it's an academic version of what I was talking about. Um, if you are a junior academic, either um, make sure that what you say on sex and gender is in line with queer theory, or research and teach something else. Now this is really, I, I find this very chilling, I'm, this really worries me, because in current circumstances it's sex and gender identity which is the issue, and what that's meaning is we're getting a false consensus. So my university hosts lots of public events uncritically platforming gender identity ideology, some, you know, calling it different things because the language changes, but you know, that's what it's doing. We cannot platform anything that's critical of gender identity ideology because we will face attacks by people who don't want us to speak. Um, and when you've got a shutdown of public, for, um, public engagement, so academics basically do three things. We do research, we do teaching, we do public engagement. Um, and anybody further back in their career than I am will not be doing research, teaching, or public, or public engagement on anything to do with gender identity ideology in any critical way, because they will get complaints about their teaching. Now, I get complaints about my teaching. They're, you know, they're made to my head of school. Um, they're not going to hurt me, because I've, I've got as far as I'm going to go. I'm not looking for any more promotions, uh, so it doesn't matter. But in the, the cutthroat world of universities, if you want promotion, or if you're a junior academic who's on a um, temporary contract and you want a permanent contract, don't risk getting complaints about your teaching. All it takes is one or two determined students to complain, and you know, you're going to find it very difficult to make progress. So there's this chilling of research and teaching and public engagement, which is very, very worrying. Universities are training the next generation of... Um, public sector workers, of third voluntary sector workers, of professionals, you know, that's who is coming out of universities. They're learning that gender identity ideology is unassailable, cannot be questioned. And they're learning that the next ideology that becomes fashionable might also be unassailable and not be questioned. I think that's a terrible thing for young people to be learning, irrespective of what the ideology is. Even if it was one that I agreed with, I hope I would be similarly horrified that anything should have to be presented as though it's unassailable in a university. So that's a long answer to your question. I'm still in a job because I'm old um, and because I'm not looking for promotion anymore. If I didn't have that, and I, I'm in a job that theoretically has academic freedom as a protection, but you, know, you, can't, you can't rely on that if you're further back in your career. I can but more junior people can't. There's a reason you've heard of the professors. There's a reason you've heard of Selena Todd and Kathleen Stock, because they're very secure professors. Yeah, they're harder to dislodge. Well, we've seen what happened with, Ka with Kathleen. Um, but yeah, there's a reason you're hearing about them and not the junior people. The junior people have to keep their heads down. They're there in universities, but they cannot speak because they will lose their jobs. Sorry, you probably didn't want to know all that. <laughs> a poor 
slightly different slant on your, my answer. I started work in 1980. I um, finished my degree, was an apprentice working in Alloa. And most of my clients, origin, uh, to begin with, were, were women, um, predominantly from the Women's Aid Refuge. Um, and what I now know um, in relation to violence against women and girls, statistics in relation to prosecutions for sexual violence, um, the understanding that the Scottish Government thinks they can do away with safeguards like corroboration or trial by jury, etc., in an effort, allegedly, to address those very poor statistics, disgusts me, to be quite frank. Um, I cannot do what I'm doing now um, properly without the knowledge of the years of experience that I've got. But had I attempted to speak out 30 years ago, I would have been sacked. I would never have worked again because it would be against the ethos of very many fairly powerful people within legal circles. Um, but there are as many within legal circles that, that agree with me um, as there are that disagree, but it's a trend, um, it's a fashion, and people don't like sometimes to tell the truth. Um, but to kind of slightly turn that around a wee bit, the reason why I do what I do now um, is because of all those years of that type of work, where I met victims and I met perpetrators, and I don't hate men, and I certainly don't hate trans people, and I'm not homophobic, I'm not biphobic, I'm not transphobic. Um, I have one phobia and it's to do with spiders. But apart from all of that, I don't think that a male-bodied person should work in a women's aid refuge. And I don't think that a male-bodied person should be given advice to victims of rape. I thought that when I was 18. I think that now when I'm 59. And I'm the immortal one. I'll still be thinking that when the rest of you aren't here anymore. It's not acceptable in a civilised country for a man to say to women who are going to a refuge or a rape crisis centre because they've been traumatised and brutalised. It is wrong that a man can say, you're not getting in here until you leave your bigotry on the doorstep. Come in and we'll talk about it. Women who've had those experiences do not go to get assistance, advice or support from intact male bodies. Um, and if you kind of go back to the sex, not gender debate um, in the Scottish Parliament, I was having to applaud as sheroes, politicians that I had spent 30 odd years fighting against in the Labour Party, but I was a member of the SNP and my head was on a swivel because all these women that I had looked up to and thought, freedom fighters, this is what we want, this is what Scotland needs, this is democracy, most of them, with a couple of notable exceptions, were voting the wrong way. But those who were at the end of their careers, most especially Joanne Lamont, you know, again, I'm shouting at the telly, in tears, watching her word, voice breaking, when she's saying all the things that I bet you practically every woman in Scotland would have agreed with. So now is time for the most famous or infamous, infamous feminist to the proverbial fingertips to learn women won't wished. Uh, it's just to say, I've got a young female relative who's a police officer, and last week a guy was arrested and was charged, and at the point of being charged, he self-ID'd as, as a woman. Then he asked to go to the toilet. She was the only female on duty, and he had to be escorted to the toilet because he'd already been charged. While they were in the toilet, he fully exposed himself to her. Where's her rights? Where's her health and safety at work? I completely agree with you. I did a bit of work on this last year with Kenny McCaskill, and he's still working on that just now because that was a kind of extension to the, the prisons issue because part of the prisons issue was obviously also in relation to prison officers and in exactly the set of circumstances that you're talking about. There was one awful instance which involved a very violent, absolutely vile man who, I, I don't, can't remember if he was on remand or serving a sentence, it'll not make any odds. And he um, obviously had identified as, you know, trans-identifying male, claiming to be female. And he was at it all the time, getting up to no good, um, requiring to be searched by females. 
And, of course, that's exactly what happened. But they had to have six females at a time. Can you imagine the kick that guy was getting out of that? But that was why he was doing it. Um, and, of course, the prison service were, were um, content to kind of promote his feelings as opposed to the safety and the dignity of the prison officers. So it's, it's unfortunately not that unusual. Um, and it's one that, that certainly all the unions and the representatives of those police officers ought to be doing something about. You've probably seen the um, trans-identifying male police officers, especially in England. There's a few of them had their photos taken. One of them in particular, was, was he not holding a taser or something up? Um, and, and you know, shouting about the rainbow flag and LGBT rights, etc. And that again brings into very sharp focus that there are rights of an awful lot of people that are being impacted very badly and wrongly by this wrong-minded process. So I'm really sorry about you, your female relative, and I hope that her union, her federation, does something well, cogent about it. I understand. Well, um, well, can I suggest that she speaks um, to a solicitor or to our union rep that she's got some confidence in, um, and do so. She can she can do that privately um, and seek some real advice because she is far from alone. Far from alone. Sorry to say. I've got, I've got two things to say. One is. If she's going to her union, my advice would be not to go to her local lay representative, but to go to a paid official, because paid officials know the law a lot better. So she's, it's worth leapfrogging. She, you would normally go to your um, representative in your workplace. I would leapfrog that, go straight to the regional office or whatever the equivalent is. Might be the whole Scotland office, but you know, leapfrog onto somebody who's paid to know the law. Um, in more general terms, I think what, what we're seeing in the Scottish Parliament from many parliamentarians is fingers in their ears, there is no conflict. There is no conflict between... No, so the, the catchphrase used to be no debate. You know, there's no debate about trans lives. The catchphrase changed during the last Holyrood elections to no conflict. Women's rights and trans rights are not in conflict. Um, and Pam Duncan Glancy, unfortunately, who's the Labour Equalities spokesperson, made a video earlier this week saying just that, which was really disappointing because that's actually not the Scottish Labour um, position at all. If you can go to MSPs, this is everybody, I've spoken to two of my regional MSPs this week, what they need to hear are specific examples of conflict because they're being told no conflict and no conflict is the new no debate. It stops any rational conversation about how we address conflicts of rights. Conflicts of rights are not a new thing. They're referred to in, they're very established in equality legislation anyway. They're referred to in the 2010 Equality Act, which is very specific that there's no hierarchy of protected characteristics. So gender reassignment doesn't, can't trump sex. Um, where there is a conflict of rights, that is resolved through evidence-based dialogue and through provisions that have, um, protect everybody. So instances like that, that are real concrete examples of where rights are in conflict between a transgender identifying person and their right to privacy or their right to be treated as the sex they want to live in versus the right of the worker in that instance. It could be the female patient on the ward versus the healthcare practitioner, you know, what, whatever it is. What, our MSPs who are the people who are going to vote on this legislation, what they need to be hearing is that there are specific conflicts. We're not saying that um, there's a fundamental conflict, you don't have to go down that route, but if you can tell your MSPs these very stories that highlight where the crunch points are, why it's not the Scottish Labour position is that to, is supportive of self-identification and supportive of strengthening the single sex exceptions. Those things are intention. They need to hear the examples, the concrete examples of why they're intention as they think about, uh, as this bill works its way through the next stages in Parliament and they think about and arrive at their position on that. So please, if you haven't already done so, please talk to your MSPs, all of them, even the ones you think are lost causes. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Um, thank you to both speakers. It's really hard to believe what we're hearing. Um, but I just wanted to ask Eva about the bill. Is there any possibility that, that, that the bill is incompetent? I mean, will there be challenges? Could the UK government challenge it? And also, if it passes, are we likely to see people from other parts of the UK coming to live in Scotland just to get the certificate? Um, and another, uh, just something uh, that's an observation, that there seems to be this narrative being pushed that the family is no longer safe for children, and that's just so dangerous. And finally, <laughs> I want to ask both of you, where did all this come from? Is the family a safe place? It depends who you're listening to, um, because if you were to consider the independent care review that Nicola Sturgeon set up a few years ago and it reported a couple of years ago and its um, recommendations comprise the promise. Um, its recommendations principally are based on saying that actually the home is the safest place, the family is the safest place, but there are a few exceptions. But there should be drives made to keep children at home wherever that's possible um, and it should be very much a last resort to consider that the home is not a safe place on the one hand. On the other, obviously, you've got guidance after guidance after guidance that suggests something different. Um, I mean, I think last week's controversy was about the, the child protection regulations and whether or not if the, was it, if a professional, and, it, and especially teachers, I think they meant, found out that children aged between 13 but not yet 16 were having sex, they didn't have to immediately tell the parents or carers because the child was entitled to confidentiality. And you know, it's another of these, there's a mark on your forehead because you can't take the brick wall any longer. Um, so it just depends who you read and who you listen to because obviously there are circumstances where legislators think that parents are not to be trusted, um, which is mainly pathetic and highly offensive. Um, in relation to whether the bill is competent or otherwise. There's a good thread on Twitter that was done originally by the lawyer Ian Smart. He's not my pal, we've got very little in common and we do not share the same, same political beliefs by a stretch, but he had a lot to say about competence, um, especially because obviously it will affect the impact of the Equality Act and the Equality Act remains reserved to Westminster. So it would be a good cop-out um, and it might be one that they'll choose for the Scottish Government to say, sorry, hold the bus, we got it wrong, we can't do this after all. Do I think they'll do that? Well, they we. Um, and that's because they've dug themselves in so far, they don't know how to get out with a bit of good grace. Um, you were asking, will people move to Scotland to get a GRC? I can think of a million and one other reasons why they would, but that, no, nah, I doubt it. <laughs> Uh, but there will be changes elsewhere eventually. Um, so um, there was one other thing, and I can't read my writing. Where did it come from? <laughs> well, you know where it came from. I'll leave you with that one. <laughs> okay, I will address where it came from. But before I do that, um, I brought another book which I won't read to you, but um, I'll just wave it at you. This is called Ten Thousand Dresses. Um, it's about a little boy who likes to wear dresses and how his parents aren't at all interested and um, don't support him in his dress wearing and don't recognise him as the girl he really is. Um, and it's very much teaching children that your parents um, are bad and wicked and don't understand you. Find your real Glitter and Sparkles family. I think it's a really problematic book. Um, I brought with me the section from... Um, the Scottish Government Guidance on Supporting Transgender Pupils on Confidentiality. What it says is, um, a transgender young person may not have told their family about their gender identity. Inadvertent disclosure could cause needless stress for the young person or could put them at, at risk and breach legal requirements. Therefore, it's best not to share information with parents or carers without considering and respecting the young person's views and rights. Which, and yet it's not saying in so many words the home is a dangerous place, but it is saying the home may be full of people who aren't enlightened 
and aren't going to support the child properly and affirm their gender identity, so only do it with the child's consent. Um, which I, I, I think, you know, that is, you, you can read that. This, this applies throughout schooling. This applies to primary schools as well as secondary schools. The idea that primary children, or teachers in primary schools, are being encouraged to believe that it's all right to keep that kind of major secret from parents, that to me is a huge red flag on safeguarding, which I find very, very worrying indeed. Um, on where it's coming from, how long you got? So it's, it's come from a number of places. One of the places is elite uni American universities. So the Ivy Leagues and um, Californian universities in the 1990s, where queer theory was developed as quite an interesting set of theories about thinking about um, <coughs> binary divisions and people. If it had stayed in the academy, it would have been interesting, you know, interesting philosophical discussions. Unfortunately, the, it then emerged out of the academy into real life. So people in universities discussing whether um, masculinities and femininities needed to be tied to male and female bodies was one interesting thing. I don't think anybody in the universities in the 1990s who was having those conversations imagined it ending with rapists in women's prisons. I don't think yeah, that was the end point of the trajectory they were thinking about. Uh, but it, that, that's the origins of queer theory which underpins the idea that your sexed body is separate from your gendered self, that sex is performative. That was one origin of it. In, you, simultaneously, there were um, groups lobbying. There's a group called Press for Change who were lobbying at very high levels to change... Um, markers around sex and gender and you know in, in some instances to get sex removed as an identity marker on passports and um, such documents so that there was a lot of work going on at the highest levels in places like the UN. I don't I, I up the top of my head it's complicated so it's worth going and having a look at uh, the backstory of press for change and who was lobbying whom for what um, in all of those places and then in the kind of mid 2000s, so around 2005, 6, 7, a lot of this was popularized on Tumblr, which is um, a very popular social media site. At the time, it's, it's been described to me at the time as the Lord of the Flies of the internet. Um, so it was a place where lots of young people were um, exploring various things to do with identity, not just gender identity, there were, there were um, lots of threads around anorexia, Anna. Um, where young people would kind of egg each other on to um, eat less and less and less and have a kind of competition about it. So that was one place in which this idea that you can have all sorts of different gender identities was popularised. And of course, the people who were doing it, who were teenagers at the time, have now grown up and um, are sometimes in influential positions. So it's come from lots of places. The pharmaceutical industry, particularly in the US, where a lot of money is to be made out of medicalization. I, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't think there is a Mr. Big behind this, but there are certainly financial interests at play. So there are lots of different interest groups who have reasons for promoting that agenda. We then have more recently the third sector groups such as Stonewall, who um, of very wealthy charities have become very respected. Once, you know, the, I, I certainly remember Stonewall in um, the 90s and early 2000s campaigning really hard to equalise the age of consent for gay men and then for gay marriage. Once those legal battles were won, they needed another cause to fight. So this was another cause they could fight. So there's lots of different competing interests. Um, and competing or, and different origins that have kind of come together into where and brought us where we are today, I think. It's not one single cause, nor is it one single conspiracy, but I do think there are some financial interests at play in the mix. I was just thinking, how do we get out of this mess? with minimum damage across the board to everybody, but kind of look after everyone at the same time. And I think it would be helpful to just go back to basics and say, what are we actually arguing about? And 
what is it that we think we're losing? And I don't really think that there's anybody in Scotland at all that bothers terribly much about what somebody thinks their gender or even their sex is. The issue really is about safety and security and dignity and decency, and that's what's in jeopardy. And it would be very easy to remedy. There is nothing, and I mean nothing in law or in practical terms, but there is in political terms, to stop the First Minister or any of the ministers announcing tomorrow, we're, we're going to go ahead with, with gender reform, we'll have a nice debate about it, we'll have a citizens' assembly about it, we'll hear all competing voices, we'll not try and stick this through on the back of a couple of flawed consultations. But the bottom line is that the Scottish Government could announce that they intend to fully protect single-sex spaces by saying that the single-sex space will be available for people of the word that I hate, natal sex only, and also create safe spaces for trans people. That is the ideal outcome, I think. Um, I don't think that any sensible, rational person can actually profoundly disagree with that, because no matter how much um, sense or sensibility you have and might feel terribly sorry for somebody who has, say, gender dysphoria, the hard fact of the matter is if you're born male, you're also going to die male, and vice versa. It can be changed, but you can live a life as a female without having to bully or impose upon natal females. Um, and I kind of think that some MSPs are needing to take that on board and to say the, women, the reason that women feel endangered and silenced and bullied is because A, we are in danger, B, we are, there are attempts to silence us, and C, we are being bullied. We're not being bullied by um, trans-identifying males with a diagnosis of dysphoria. We're being bullied by the other guys that think that they can have a beard and wear whatever they want, make themselves up however they want, but we'll agree that they are so female that they're allowed into female wards and toilets and everything else. But when I was wee, I was told not to speak to strangers. So was everybody else in here. So if I was ever in a toilet in a, a supermarket or wherever, and I get a lady's toilet and somebody that looked like a man came in, I would have known to run a mile because he wasn't meant to be there. These days, does my granddaughter, when she's in the toilet and see two men coming towards her, how does she know which of them's a man and which of them's a woman? You can't tell. And that's not the fault of anybody who's a trans person. It's the fault of legislators who allow male bodies into single-sex female spaces. And that's what needs to be eradicated. And if that was sorted sensitively, we wouldn't be here. Hi. Hello. Hi. This is more just a comment, but um, what are men doing? Why are they being so passive and generally quite pathetic, especially in the police? Do you mean, like this woman said, uh, her daughter was basically subject to indecent exposure. These men are meant to be protecting society. We have a social contract, uh, contract and not just a social contract. We are citizens and we pay taxes to pay for these services. And the police are meant to protect us. So why are the police, they may have had equality and diversity training, but why are they actually taking part in offences against women? So that's what I believe has happened when the police make a female police officer interact with a sex offender. They are actually criminal, in my opinion, and by any normal standard, I would consider them criminals. So what are men playing at generally? And this is to, not to the guys in this room, because at least they turned up to this. But what are men doing? Do you mean? They've got daughters, they've got wives, and they've got like their own self-respect. Why are they just going along with lies and why are they actually perpetuating abuse to women and their colleagues, their wives, their daughters, their sons? Do we, sorry, it's just more of a comment, but if you'd like to, just, if you know men, why are they doing this? Um, in the case of the police, they've been stonewalled. Um, they've been led to believe that gender identity is a protected characteristic when it's not. Um, and I think that the stonewall advice generally is that if somebody says that they're undergoing gender reassignment, then, in effect, they're allowed to self-identify into the other sex. And that takes priority over 
the single sex rights that say police women or you know female patients or whatever might otherwise have so in that respect i think stonewall's got a lot to answer for it's not the whole scenario but it's a, a good bit of it given that we know how widespread their influence has been including obviously within various echelons of the scottish government um i think a lot of men aren't interested yeah it's not a big deal to them if they haven't got female relatives who are directly affected then they're, they're not interested some men are yeah we've got some fantastic men on our side they're very small in number um i'm aware of the group of lefty men who've always wanted to be able to have a go at mouthy bolshy women and never been able to and now they suddenly can i've i, I i'm a by habit you know for the last uh, 35 years i've been a very active trade unionist i'm now not in my trade union anymore that's because my trade union has many lefty men in who are delighted that they can now have a real go at older mouthy women yes and not only can they have a go and hey you know get lots of adulation for it i have lots of young women telling them how heroic they are for it can you imagine anything better you know so uh, men have all sorts of reasons but you know, a, a lot of men aren't interested i don't want to generalize about all men obviously and we have some exceptions here in the room and thank you very much but many men aren't interested in what happens to women that's how patriarchy works we have the mic up the front please Hi, good evening it's a uh, a wee point for the man's point of view to kind of defend us a wee bit. A lot of men, I've got four generations under me now, I've got to that age. <clears throat> a lot of people of my age are embarrassed to talk about female things. I know when I'm talking, I've been going out with brochures to schools about the kids' stuff. And women are saying to me, what's that about? And I've now got to the hard stage where I can tell them. It's about sex with kids and everything that's evolved. And, but a lot of men my age can't do that. They're too embarrassed. Even the generation below me, are, it's a step back for them. They can't, they can't do that. The younger ones in teens and early 20s, they're beginning to understand that. I had a discussion with Diego, a guy in his mid-20s. He didn't realise what was going on. Uh, but we're not long in enlighten them. But it's uh, information. We're not... Us older guys are not informing them well enough. It's not that men are not doing it. Okay, we know there's some men that waste their time. Uh, I'm a real left winger, so it's I'm still for it for stand up for women. So I think it's lack of information, lack of education for men to get involved. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question, but if I could just add a wee bit onto that as well, as this, um, for my explanation, it's kind of like saying why are a lot of men not involved in politics. But you can, there's just some folk can't be bothered, or they're too busy. They've got lots of other things going on in, in their life, and that. I mean, um, you know, I've got a, a daughter, a granddaughter. I had a brilliant mum and a brilliant grand, so that's why I'm here. I have the time, and I have the inclination I guess you know but uh, yeah it's difficult I, I wanted to speak a wee bit more about the where did it come from thing and I do agree it didn't start with big money I believe it took huge steps forward more recently uh, in, the, in the early um, you know uh, well 20 I don't know 2025 or something there was huge amounts of money was pumped into college uh, colleges, I believe, to, to take control of their boards, get people on the boards and that. Uh, that's what I believe it, it's come from. Uh, and, and, but what I'm trying to understand, and, and you know, it's the, the disproportionate sort of response to the, you know, to the 
problem, if we can call that problem, or the, the amount of people that are involved, it, it doesn't make sense to me. And, and I'm thinking, like the SNP, what, why is it made such a huge issue? What, and you, you, you think there must be something else, something sinister that drives them on. I don't know if you have a view on that. I, I think for most people it isn't something sinister. Um, I'm a Labour Party member. What I've noticed on the left is that it's become very hard to have a class analysis. So when I got into left-wing politics, we were all talking about class all the time. We were all talking about material inequalities. What can we do to reduce the gap between rich and poor? What can we do to reduce the wealth gap? What can we do to improve people's life chances and therefore their material um, circumstances was what we were all engaged in. It feels like we lost that battle. You know, since the mid-70s, the gap between rich and poor has widened, the wealth gap has widened even more, um, and the opportunity gap has widened. It feels like we've lost that battle, and what we've been handed instead is identitarianism, that we can, you know, the thing that's left for the left to play with is identity politics, is making people feel better, making people feel um, respected, whilst the poor get poorer. But instead of addressing that because that's too difficult, let's in instead have a civil rights movement that looks at ever finer and finer questions of identity while not making any material difference to people's real lives. To me, that's a lot of it. Um, I, I just think there's many, many things going on. But for me, as a, as a lefty, you know, it's that retreat from class into that very individualised politics um, of equal opportunity rather than looking at outcomes and narrowing the wealth gap. Would you, would you agree though that there are large, massive amounts of money to be made out of this, especially if we can get more and more people on medication at a younger age? Is that...? <coughs> I, I do think that's in there somewhere. I, I don't believe in conspiracy theories around this, and I, you know, I don't think there's a single mastermind or a single organisation. I don't think it's, um, I don't, that's what's happening. But I do think the pharmaceutical industry is huge. You know, the medical pharmaceutical industry complex is, is an enormous thing, and there is certainly money to be made. There's a, there's a market. If you get people on hormones young, if you get people having major invasive surgery on healthy tissue, they're going to need aftercare. Um, yeah, if you give somebody, if you give somebody a hysterectomy in their late teens, early 20s, they're going to be a lifelong medical patient. Um, so there's certainly money to be made in it. The extent to which it's the driving force, I don't know. And I, I don't think there's a Mr. Big somewhere pulling the strings or a single organisation. I don't disagree with anything that Shireen has said, but I think that there's a couple of aspects that might be almost unique to the Scottish Government. Um, and that is, they, I think, and probably most folk here agree, that they thought they would sneak this through a couple of years ago. They didn't expect there to be the outcry that there was when women, more switched on than I was at that point, um, started speaking up about it. Um, but what's also really interesting is, if you look at the Scottish Government website generally, Practically every area of that refers no longer to sex but to gender, so that we don't have a, a pay gap between men and women, we've got a gender pay gap. Um, if you look at diversity and inclusion as it's referred to in most government policies, again the vocabulary that's always used is gender. It's like the word sex doesn't exist anymore. Um, if you look at application forms for jobs um, within the Scottish Government or in various um, related agencies, the you name and address, date of birth, national insurance number, gender. When did that happen? That happened a year past October when suddenly there was a decision taken following consultation that they would no longer ask you to confirm your sex, which is just, what is the point of that? Um, but one of the application forms that was so altered was in relation to enhanced disclosure. So that when you apply for the enhanced disclosure certificate now to enable you to work obviously with children, vulnerable adults, etc., 
again, you're asked for your gender. So I had a big spat because Stirling Council wanted me to renew mine. I had to do it online. And when I was trying to go through it to fill it out, it came to gender. So obviously I had a million and one emails from them about, I'm not telling you my gender because I've not got one. Um, why can I not have a form that asks me for my sex? And actually, more to the point, if you're going to be applying for enhanced disclosure to work with children and vulnerable adults, is that not an area where it's actually quite important to know your sex, not your gender? Um, the answer, though, was the fact that the gender box, um, if you were doing what I hadn't done at first, but looking at it properly on the right kind of computer, went from male, female, wouldn't say, don't want to say none. So this stupid government process was absolutely pointless. Why ask any of that if you were allowed to say none or don't want to say? It was just pathetic. So I've now got an enhanced disclosure certificate that tells you nothing, tells you my name and address, but you don't know what sex or gender I am. So I think there's, there's a thing there in the Scottish government that is a, somebody's pet project and they're doing their best to extend the tentacles right round every aspect of to a life that the government controls. We're going to have to say goodbye to Shireen. She's got a train to catch. So thank you very much for all your input. <laughs> I think we're pretty much done here. Can I have a round of applause for Eva? She's been marvellous. Thank you.